All right. Hello and welcome back to another happy hour with Backflip. I'm Ryan Fring, one of your co-hosts here. And joining me as always every week over on this side is John Shoemaker. Say hey, John. Hello. How's it going? How are you? We're both at home. Yeah, we are. That we are. I was doing chores, trying to squeeze in some some (laughs) hard work in between more work. In between the easy work, <laughs> I, I don't know. I realized that it was all just work. <laughs> you realized where it was going, and you bailed. Um, so, joining us today, we've got our good friend and cinematographer pal John Klein. Let me just go ahead and add you to the stream down here. Hey, John, how's it going, man? Hi, gentlemen. Good to see you both. You good too, to as here. well. <laughs> Thank you for the invite. Yeah, now we can start the real conversation. (laughs) Yes, I look forward to embarrassing myself live in front of all six of our Facebook friends. Yeah, it's great. And three of them are probably us checking the stream to make sure that it works. So. <laughs> yeah. oh, I forgot to send my mom a link. Oh, well, oh my sure gosh. My mom, so. Or just Aunt Karen. Just make sure Karen knows, Aunt Karen, uh, that we're here. <laughs> Everybody's got um, yeah. Aunt Karen now, right? Well, that's and that's a fun experiment, too, with these. I mean, for us, it's been really fun to just connect and catch up with people. It started during quarantine. Now we're a little less strict quarantine, you know, stay at home stuff. Um, but it's still just so cool to be able to catch up. And now this is just a way that people are naturally doing it. Um, and so I love that we can just continue it. And everyone, you know, we've had about six or seven of these. And we haven't had to try too hard to do it. Everyone's just ready to live stream and, and to have a video chat, uh, which is which is cool. So, yeah, thanks for coming on, man. Thank you. Yeah, the, the bugs have been worked out. Everybody knows, like, Oh, maybe I should turn my phone sideways if everybody else is sideways. <laughs> or yeah. maybe I should have my wife uh, turn off the, the vacuum cleaner or, you know, send the kid to the backyard or whatever so that I can get through this phone call. Well, and those funny, those are funny little things too. I was on a meeting maybe three times with someone, someone new, check that out. Um, and probably the first two times they share an office with their husband oh. and their husband would just all of a sudden be like, hello? Yeah. No, I was thinking of going over that. And she's like, she's like, Bill, Bill, I'm on, Bill. <laughs> it's like, it's just a, such a great thing. <laughs> the throwback to being, you know, 18 or less, and your your mom picks up the phone at your <laughs> For those of you who know what landlines yeah. are. Yeah. Mom, I'm on the phone. Mom, stop Damn talking. It, mom. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, we all would have experienced that. Um you know, probably anyone our age and older would have experienced that. Anyone younger than us probably has no idea what a landline is or a corded phone. My children, my children will. We've got a landline <laughs> upstairs because we've got DSL. So we have to have at least a basic level um, landline connected. And then we just had, I don't know why, where or why we had this. We had this very old cordless phone. That's plugged in up there. But then my wife bought a corded phone, like this old green. It might even be rotary. I think it is a rotary phone. Um, and we haven't figured out how to make it work yet. We need some sort of adapter to like make, because the, the plug, although it's the same, doesn't quite do the right thing or something. Um, but she was like, this is going to be awesome. We're going to like make our kids use this as they get older and like not let them get you know cell phones and stuff until they're much older and then they're gonna have to like use the phone and like you know they can only go as far as the cord will go it's gonna be awesome here i'm gonna i'm gonna try to get shifty with it there we go rotary phones (laughs) try to explain Um, that to people anybody who's got like three nine number you're like you know what i'm not even gonna call you it's too much work. yeah (laughs) <laughs> or any zeros. Oh my gosh. Oh yes. All the oh, way. Yeah. Ones you felt so cool. Um, I don't know if my parents ever had a rotary phone. I think maybe just my grandma. Um my my I think yeah, I think my parents just had the big chunky, you know, wall mounted ones. Kind of like the Zach Morris, but the the one before the the mobile version, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I oh, remember man. My mom had a a car phone for a while, the Zach Morris. (laughs) Car phone, yeah. Yeah, It came in like a bag. (laughs) Yeah, like a big old like canvas, like 25 pounds. (laughs) 
my how, how technology has changed. <laughs> yeah, like we were talking about this earlier and that's that's a part of the funny thing about like these happy hours is like we jump into a conversation about a half an hour early, but I try not to ask too many questions because I just want to get it all recorded and get it all on the, you know, um, happy hour podcast, whatever. Um, but technology, like we were talking about, like this stream, this is a tool that we use sometimes um, called StreamYard, which the UW was using. And I saw and I reached out and they, they uh, told us what it was. But, you know, you can kind of see it gives you some cool mixing options like this um, just to make it a little more dynamic. You know, we've got the graphics on there. Got the, but uh, that's nice. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, too, like the graphics were built for this page that I can't show because it'd be a background. But um, it was video. You know, it was all initially video for OBS that wasn't working. But speaking of technology, you were talking about your your initial lockdown setup. And I remember, and maybe I was in a meeting with you, like we did like this, uh, you know, little Midwest um, people who do production and things, just chat on like what the hell is going on and how they're feeling. What's up, yeah. That was the title. <laughs> I think that was the official invite that I got. Yes, um, it's some sort of group you, commiseration. You were on a ridiculous camera. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, the Area Alexa Mini LF. So I pre-ordered that camera at this point like a year and a half ago. As soon as they announced mm. it, I was, I was excited. Um, and the the base kit is around $80,000. Mm -hmm. So of course I was very excited and waiting for it to come and waiting for it to come. And I'm like, oh, it'll be here soon. And then, you know, got to clear customs. And then mm -hmm. we were in that phase where they're like, well, some shipping from some places is held up because of coronavirus in China. So like you can't, you know, so it kept getting delayed and delayed. And then it showed up like seven days before lockdown. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so of course the natural thing to do is have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars worth of web conference equipment for <laughs> <laughs> talking to my friends about oh, how we're not going to, yeah. Yeah. Because it's just sitting there on a conference call. Exactly. Exactly. Well, it yeah. has to be something. And, uh, anybody, you know, you guys know how it is when you grab a piece of equipment, there, we go. Oh, there it is, there it is. Um, when you work with something new, um, it's much easier to work when it's not for a paying client, right? Oh yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, area mm -hmm. super intuitive, easy to use camera. So it's not like it's filled with surprises, but at the same time, I felt a lot better, you know, noodling around on a webcast rather than um, mm -hmm. smashing my way through a commercial shoot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know, uh, those things you don't know, you don't know, you know, menus, um, having used area cameras in the past, you might know where it's been in the past, but because it's a different sensor and body than, you know, that other camera, uh, there's going to be other features and other menu options. And that's, that's what I'm often terrified of. I'm like, I know it can do this. I just don't know what they call it or where it is. And for me, Sony's maybe the worst, like Sony just makes up names for things. Uh, and so you got to try to find what that name is. And then once you find it, you know where it is forever, but that, that's sometimes no the pain of my existence. I have no idea how Sony manages to make their menu so complex. <laughs> they do a great job making cameras and I do love mm -hmm. to change every setting, but you know, you look at an area interface and it's like, Oh, okay. It must go like this. And you just no. Mm -hmm. And then you open up the Sony interface and they're like, okay, so there's seven tabs and a lot of those have like three or four sub tabs. Those are just multiple right. Changes. And you're like, okay, right. so I want to format the card. So that's like tab seven, <laughs> second page down, it's the third item. Right. And this is probably one of the thing, you know, one of the top 10 things you do on a regular basis, but but it's buried in a menu. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Although they're they're higher end stuff. Um, they're like uh, the cinema cameras and like the FS7 series and whatnot. Mm -hmm. They have the user menu, which is a total game changer because then you can actually undo some of the terrible decisions they made in design. And you can you can set that up. Is that how that works? I yeah, so like my user that. menu yeah. for all my Sony cameras, it's like format card is one of the first options up there. Mm -hmm. and basic stuff that um, you might be doing every day. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm I'm really bad at, at those user menu things. I have like a MySpace sort of <laughs> moment where I just like <laughs> panic 
and I don't know what to do. And I just put all kinds of things in there. And then I have an even worse menu. So I, I was like UX designers. And so if they don't get it right the first time, I'm, I'm hopeless. You, you know what? I wish that there was a feature on phones, like my, my mobile phone, as well as cameras where you had a list of like most used functions or, or options or something. Cause sometimes I think I yeah. need stuff, right? I think I need stuff. And so I put it up front and then I always find myself looking for other things. And then you just develop that pattern and you, you forget that it's not efficient because you develop that pattern. I just wish, you know, and then I have a very efficient, un inefficient home screen, like certainly on my mobile phone um, or on a, on a user menu like that. I feel like I would run into the same thing because your expectation is not necessarily always the same as reality. And how often do I go back and revise those things? I don't probably, you know, I'll set it up once. I'll be like, I think this is the best thing ever. And then you just go because you got to work. And when you're working, you know, you're running around and you're trying to get all the shots in that you can. Futs in with a menu and saving a new setting is not a great time. And then when you're not doing that, you know, you're working on post or you're selling hard or, you know, trying to be a person and have a life and hang out with your family, you know? So that's, that's also why I try to think about this as a bit of a hobby as well. Like I'm going to take the camera home and just fart around with it. Kind of like you did for the conference, you know, or, or for the conferencing. I, I think you just pitched a brand new phone app that could go viral very fast. You know, like you, you heard just, it here. Yeah. You Copyright. press the button and it's, Bam, here's all your apps listed in order you actually use them in. Mm -hmm. so that like one weird thing from Adobe that you need because your boss says you have to have it, but you're never going to use it. It's now off the <laughs> Yeah, it just slides away. I'm, I've been iPhone for a few years. I still have moments where I'm like, I can't find the app. I've been looking yeah. at my phone for four <laughs> minutes. I'd swear, I know it's installed. So then I go over <laughs> to search and I like type it in. Yep. Like, how? I find myself constantly searching, just pull down and search. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Well, and especially when I'm on set, like, and I think I've created like photographer folder, cinematographer mm -hmm. folder, director folder, but sometimes I'm like, Oh, I like that photography app and you know, got to look around and I'm like, wait, did I put that in the cinematography folder? And then I just end up searching. I'm like, it's useless that I have it organized in any way. I'm just going to search. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so, well, and you get like, you know, if you've got the GoPro app, and then you've got the Osmo app. And like, mm -hmm. I don't know about you guys, like what gear you're most into, but because I run the rental shop, there's a ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, do I leave all that stuff on my phone? You know, do it like if I have an app for like one color changing LED bar, like, mm. you know, do I leave it on there forever? So yeah, things get, it gets buried pretty fast. Mm -hmm. Well, and I have, I have it set up to like to offload things, specifically like on iPads that we use for drone and things like that because they don't have a lot of, we don't, I didn't buy them with a lot of storage. Uh -huh. um, and when they're not droning, they're just, you know, office work or whatever. Um, so I have it set up to offload apps that aren't being used regularly. And then I'll come back after a month and it offload the fricking drone app. And so like I'm driving out to drone, I'm like, oh, tether and download, I guess, <laughs> you know, it's stupid stuff like that. Yeah, or we're in the middle of no or we're in the middle of nowhere and you're like, oh, dang it. I need to download yeah. this app, but I have no network. Yeah. And then even if you do have the app downloaded, they're like, it's a mandatory update. You can only fly like, yes. you know, up to 10 feet before you have to <laughs> install the update. Yeah. <clears throat> no, get out of my apps. Ignore, 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 ignore. <laughs> yeah. I think you can continue to ignore, right? The mandatory map updates. See, I'm, I'm trying to determine whether it means that like we're getting older or whether <laughs> or whether we're or whether we're finding, get off my lawn. Yeah, we're, we're finding out like the limitations. You know, we don't we're not starry eyed, you know, yeah. young uh, tech techie kids anymore. We're like, OK, well, these things are cool, but like I've used them and you run into problems in these scenarios and they're convenient, but this is where the analog does work better. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Gear lust is, I mean, it, it affects all ages, but maybe I would say it was worse in my twenties than my forties. 
Well, don't you don't you feel like you have more patience now? How do you mean? Well, like I mean, for phones, I would always like follow everything and read everything and be like, oh, I need that new phone. And same thing with cameras. But now I'm kind of at a, at a point where you know, like Nab Nab's canceled uh, this year, and I was expecting you know maybe Black Magic to announce something and to see you know whatever new thing Red has. Um, I don't know if I saw any announcement from Red. Um, but I feel like they might just be holding off now for the next big event that they can put on. And I'm totally fine with that. You know, I'm like, Oh, I could wait a year. Which you know, the, to like younger the only me. Camera, the cool. only camera I will not forgive is the, the mystery a seven S three, which should have been released like nine times by now. Oh really? Um, well, I mean, cause it's the a seven S two is, I don't even know, six years old or something obscene. Isn't that old now? Um, and so people were saying like rumors of the a7s3 were coming out. I, I mean, it feels like when I was in college, I mean, it's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's one I've been sort of, uh, curious about. Um, and, the Canon's R5 is really interesting to me, but, um, in general, yeah, I think I'm a lot less, um, I mean, I've seen great work done on $800 cameras. Mm -hmm. I've done great work on $800 cameras. So like that itch to have the next great thing, it's like, it depends on the circumstance, right? Like most mm -hmm. of what you're paying for past the first few thousand dollars on a camera rig is like, how does it work on set? How does it mm -hmm. function with the tools that I have as opposed to like, does it look good? Um, mm -hmm. Which was what was driving me, you know, as I was, getting started. So it's like, oh, well, this camera does 720p. So, mm -hmm. um, and I think it really did matter. But at this point, you know, if you're shooting with 4K or 8K, right? who, who cares? <laughs> well, and the difference, you know, the difference between standard def and high def was huge. The difference between high def and 4K, you know, I, I just got a 4K TV like last, it was my birthday in December. And we sit about six feet away from it, set six to eight feet away from it, it's 50 inches or whatever. So that's right at the edge of being able to see the detail. Um, and I, I do feel like I could see the detail. Also, it's what I do. So, you know, I'm hyper aware of that. My wife's like, yeah, it looks nice. I don't, I don't know. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's so creamy and beautiful and contrasty. Like, look at those blacks. Um, but yeah, it's interesting though, because I feel like now the cell is um, your capture format, like, well, it's important to have a good high capture format so that you can reframe, you know, um, or you can down res and even, and we know this to be true as well, take a 4k signal, um, in down res to 1080p. And that is often crisper than a 1080p image because of the sampling, you know, because of the way that the sampling on the 4k with the computer can you know create an image based on or, or versus that old 1080p technology so you know that's the cell now but yeah are we going to have 8k tvs probably but it's not going to be the same thing as sd to hd right oh not at all not even close we uh i'm certain that most people don't even think about oh is this 4k or not unless you know they're being upsold unless they're standing in best buy like well, yes, we get look I'm at uh, best buy mode. <laughs> <laughs> look at how people are actually watching our stuff, though. Like, you turn on just go to a oh, stream, yeah. turn on their television, and watch and see what they're doing. It's like everything's green. Like, why is it so green? And then, like, is that 60 frames per second? No, no, it's 120 motion smoothing at 120 frames a second, right? right. And like, like crazy contrast and like dynamic. Um, like there's a lot of tools that are like starting to be good, but because there's no standard, they're just brutal. Like mm -hmm. yeah. how would, like it would be great if there was like a, if we started to coalesce around a standard for like, okay, so all content that's HDR, you know, gets this flag going in. Um, you could imagine if you could flag content so that you'd be like, okay, this is shot in 16 by nine, but it is, um, you know, it's four by three safe, so chop off the edges versus I could also send a flag that says it's not four by three safe. So if you have to add black bars, add bars, yeah. Like it like all these problems should have been solved by now. It's really sort of sad to watch. But then, you know, if you've 
had the the joy of watching on somebody's TV where they have letterbox bars twice and pillar box bars. And it's yeah, been 123 like seconds. <laughs> yes. And it was actually originally like a, you know, like a, a 2.4 like ultra widescreen, but then they cropped it off too. So yeah. <laughs> I yeah. I'm curious to know, John, maybe you have perspective on this with some of the equipment that you look at, like so what Ryan brought up about capture format and you know you have a better high resolution going in so that you can like manipulate it later. With the whole 1080p, this is even within 1080p and 4K. So last year, maybe at NAB, we were starting to see some of the booths talking about like 8K or whatever. And there were a few booths talking about 8K screens, which just makes me like roll my eyes like a teenage girl. I don't know. I don't, some, I just, and I'm some like, person who rolls their eyes. I, are we, are we hitting? the maximum like we already passed it in audio right like at 192 or something unless you're an audiophile you say you can hear more like we've passed what you can perceive with human ears and like where are we with like video you know like you're not going to watch a screen like this so like at some point you can't perceive it so how far do we go um, well, my hope uh, is that we've kind of hit near the end of that for, in terms of resolution. Yeah. But um, that's the marketing department just have to learn how to talk about dynamic range and overall brightness. That's what will change. You know, like right now, if I hung a TV up in your living room and I, you know, I show you a camera of what's outside, you're going to look at that TV, uh, even, you know, ignoring the depth, ignoring 2D or 3D, you look at it and be like, it's a television. Like you just know because your television is not as bright as the window and your eye can see like the shadow under the tree is 16 stops darker than like the person walking outside in a yellow shirt. Um, but that will change. And I think that's what's really interesting. Um, and also gives engineers a chance to totally mess up what we're doing again, as they come up with ways to like add HDR to classic movies, <laughs> which Ooh, boy. will be terrible. <laughs> yeah. If if we'll still have classic movies pre twenty twenty, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> They'll just all have those warnings on them, like this. This yeah. picture may contain outdated cultural values, super and terrible things. But that's okay. Yeah, take some good things out of it, not the bad things. Yeah, yeah. No, everyone was racist in twenty seventeen. <laughs> <laughs> We're just gonna deep fake, you know, modern actors into all the old movies anyway. Oh Ooh. my gosh, that'd be great. Well. So, and in, to that point too, and I do want to circle back around and have you give us a good introduction because we never did that, but <laughs> I do want to do that. You can leave, um, we'll roll out here. I'll, I'll... Yeah, <laughs> everyone just. <laughs> um, uh, but, but to that point, you know, contrast uh, and, and dynamic range on a set is always getting better and better, um, which is interesting. But yeah, I do wonder, you know, because our eyes, um, I'm trying to think of the science behind it. it. It's been a few years since I've read about this, um, but I believe our eyes can adjust so fast. You know, the dynamic range that we think we perceive is just is, is extreme. You know, obviously when you're inside something dark and you walk outside, you have you have to have a second to adjust. But if you're you know if you are just outside and you go and look in a shaded area, the difference between that is way beyond what you know a camera can ha handle. Like you know even. I don't know how many stops that would be. You could go up to, I don't know, F90, um, get get something, you know, the sun bouncing off something white, uh, and then just go to dark, right? So it's huge. And I think film better uh, simulated that in that it was just a smooth range from top to bottom. Whereas with our digital sensors, we see uh, a kind of a digital representation that ends up being more perceptible to our eyes than film is because of the way that it exposes. And that's one of the things that you see with Airy, right? They, what was it there? Alexa was was never 4K. It was like, is the Alexa 2.7? Uh, depending on how you measure it, like 2.8 to 3.2. The, the Okay, the yeah. So, you know, it's not 4K, but by golly, you know, anyone shooting with an Alexa who knows what they're doing, 
can make the best, you know, some of the best looking images uh, out there, but it's not 4K, right? So why is that? Well, it's these other things as well, you know, it's that dynamic range and um, the image that that technology can can capture. So I'm interested in maybe even losing the talk about megapixels and getting into a realm where we're talking about range as it coordinates with film or with you know kind of our how our eyes see because it's back to your point of you see a screen you can immediately tell there's qualities to it that tell your eye that it's not the same as looking outside i think one of those is certainly dynamic range um like you said it's brightness as well but they have to be able to figure out uh in contrast has gotten better but figure out how do you have something that's 20 stops brighter you know than the dark ranges on a TV set. Like, how do you do a pixel like that? Well, and does the audience want to see that? Like, we haven't even tried it to find out. I mean, the audience doesn't always want, you know, like, if I said, I can get you a camera where everything's in focus all the time, and see, that sounds better, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Things in focus are good. So, like, you know, on this camera, you can see the pictures of my daughter back there, and she's, um, yeah, she's uh, pretty sharp. That could be a feature, right? But, like, Ultimately, it's not cinematic. Go. Yeah, there she is. Yeah, that's cute. She's kind of a uh, 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 peach blob, but it looks very cute. Okay. <laughs> well, that's at 480p or whatever we've got working on. <laughs> we need more pixels. Yes, we do. Um, my <laughs> but uh, I guess we may find that the audience doesn't actually want mm. more data. You know, like we talked about frame rate, right? Is two hundred and point yeah. better than twenty four? No, maybe to some but people, some of the time. The Hobbit at forty eight, but not, no, not better most of the time. Yeah. So like, I like I like being in the mm -hmm. world. I like you know like a three sixty camera, for example, that says we're going to remove the whole like we pointed the camera somewhere. You know that mm -hmm. variable's gone. You point the camera. Where do you want to see? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't actually always make the story better. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's very interesting with cinema and with books, you know, because when you read a book, it's it's your own interpretation, your mind's eye. So you have to bring something to it. It's an engaging experience with cinema. It's still the same, but you're given more in the sense that you're given more stimulus, you're given more visuals. Um, Sorry, I got distracted. Jenny Quinn says uh, John can't watch TV without adjusting everything. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I mean, to do it right. If you leave uh, motion smoothing on, we're going to have a talk. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I turn it <laughs> off every time I go to my parents' house, and I'm like, did somebody turn this back on? Why is this on? Um, but but that that experience, right? So you're reading a book, and you bring something to it, and you create something new with, you, with your interaction with the book. Same thing with with what I would call cinema or, you know, any type of visual entertainment, uh, TV or movie or otherwise, you're getting more stimulus in the terms of visuals, but you're still taking all of your experiences and baggage and encountering it and applying it. And I think the reason that that still works in the way that it does in that hyper real way is because it doesn't look real and doesn't feel real because when I saw, and I didn't see it in theater, but I saw 48 uh, frame rate Hobbit, um, I was like, ooh, it just looks too real and I don't like it. I don't want my fantasy to look real like there's a goblin over there. I want it to have motion blur, you know, and feel like what I understand as kind of cinematic storytelling, well, you know, wonder, which, which is a different thing. So I, I read an article about this, this is a little, like a, several years ago now, because I was reading about uh, resolution and someone was talking about frame rate in that article saying that frame rate was going to be more important, especially for like IMAX films and stuff where you want it to mm. you know, like, that's where you want the high frame rate. Um, but they were actually talking about the reason that the lower frame rate. So 24 was based on 48 uh, kilohertz. Hertz for audio. Yeah. Um, so it was a, a <clears throat> visible um, by that on your yeah. film stock, right? Yeah, but the reason that it's more uh, 
pleasing is actually a psychological thing, which I think I can even tie into our discussion about dynamic range with your eyes, is that when we're watching something with our brains and like these like sen image sensors, we're processing it and we can add information. And so something about 24 frames a second engages your brain more because you're filling in some information. You're filling mm. in if there's if there are blurry frames or whatever. Just like and, we have to imagine like what Dumbledore's outfit looks like if it hasn't been described for us. Right. Well, yeah, right. So, yeah, exactly. You have I to was, engage. I was actually wondering if that's the I wonder I mean there's I'm sure there's studies, but like what is the dynamic range of the human eye? Well, if you've looked at a shadow and then looked at the highlights, your eyes actually may have adjusted your pupils, your iris but you hold the information in your brain. So in your peripheral, you can still see the detail of that shadow, but you're not actually seeing it. You're just like putting together a whole image with a much more advanced processor. So true. That is absolutely true. You can take that to the bank. I, uh, I was, I remember being floored when I heard. So if you, if you show a person a moving object, they can track the moving object and they can catch it. Um, and if you add a strobe light to that experience, they will not perceive that the strobe light went off when the ball was at the point that it got hit. Like they will see that the strobe light went off at a different time because their brain it knows to account for the processing delay between their eye and the moment they understand what they're seeing. Does this make sense? Yeah. So like we have this complex system between our we're, eyes, we're tweening. Hand. Our brains are tweening. Yes, they're they're anticipating. So, like when I'm seeing something, my brain is already whatever six frames something behind, right? But, <clears throat> yeah. But I've accounted for it, so I can catch a baseball that I haven't yet seen. <laughs> so amazing. I just spelled pictures wrong in our chat. <laughs> Nobody judge me. <laughs> yeah, the wonder of our brains. <laughs> We're so smart. We so smart. Um, all right, so now that we've got the true believers on and we're about 35 minutes in, John, can you give us a little bit of an introduction of who you are and what you do? Uh, I am John Klein. I am, I do a lot of stuff. I'm probably top list the cinematographer. I do commercial cinematography, um, narrative, uh, shorts, sometimes music videos, everything um, that involves running a camera and lighting departments. Uh, I have been doing that for, for maybe 15 years, give or take. And I also, about six years ago, started a company supporting people who do what I do. Um, we rent cameras, lenses, lights, camera support, uh, that sort of equipment uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin and uh, various other related uh, entrepreneurial activities to that. But fortunately, that's grown to the place where I don't have to run it. So those are that's all employees that handle that. And I just get to show up and test out the cool new gear. And uh, I leave a mess. I'll, uh, I, I warn every employee that I'm my own worst customer. So I can just take all the equipment and then like leave the cables poorly wrapped and uh, <laughs> lose lens caps and they just <laughs> replace them you're, for me you're god-given right <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 it's it's part of what feeds the habit right because you you know you need gear to do the job but then you know kind of our business is hurry up and wait right it gets really intense and then you wait and then it's intense and wait and you know we don't work whatever it is 250 days out of the year we're not on set 250 days out of the year so what do you do the other days? And you know, you're renting your equipment, which is genius. Yeah, it's uh, well, it works for me. It uh, it helps justify the crazy purchases, you know. So mm -hmm. you you point out like what 250 days not on set, and that's yeah. Historically, I've been like a good year for me has 100 days on set, which mm -hmm. is weird to explain to people that like two thirds of what I'm doing isn't what you think I do. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but the uh, the equipment does just sit on the shelf. Um, and when it turns into hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of stuff, and when it you know requires its own, you know, thousand square foot space to keep it all in, then suddenly it's uh, 
it's beneficial that it can be making money or being useful in other days. Mm -hmm. And you're, are you in the Chicagoland area now? Yeah, so I live in Glenview, which is, um, okay. when, when you account for traffic, I'm like equidistant between Milwaukee downtown and Chicago downtown. Oh, okay. Yeah, what's, uh, do you just run up and get gear, or do you have a good way to get it sent, or what's your what's your kind of solution there? Yeah, I have some stuff that is, um, that kind of lives in my house, a small collection of stuff, um, and then if it's more complex than that, usually I'll have a few days warning so I can run up and grab it, or there's, there's ways, courier services and stuff. I've got an employee mm -hmm. who Work, lives in Kenosha, so sometimes it'll be three quarters of the way down already, which makes that easy too. Oh, so. nice. Uh, Kenosha, my old stomping grounds. I don't know if you, you probably knew that, that, uh, you know, where TC's from, that's, yes. I, I live there for a portion of my life. I did not know it was for long, but. Uh, yeah. John makes fun of me. People ask where I'm from. I say, it's very complicated. Uh, but I did live a portion of my life in Kenosha. <laughs> well, it's because I complicated. I, I I I say I grew up in Mayville. <clears throat> but I was there from fourth grade through the end of high school, and then I went to Madison for college. And Ryan's like time in Kenosha is the same, <laughs> but he has like I'll, I lived somewhere else before that when I was a lot younger. But I'm like. I don't know. Yeah, I, I lived I lived in Kenosha for about six years of my life, uh, and then I my my father was in the military, so born in Virginia, moved to Rhode Island, then Florida, and then up to Kenosha. So two thirds of my life was el elsewhere up right. until I graduated high school, and then now I've been in Madison. Uh, let's see, about seventeen years now. So it's obviously the longest I've lived anywhere. But uh, enough really? about me. We'll get it to him. We'll get it to him. Uh, so we we had that conversation early on. I forget what it was called. It was like Midwest production people talk about the crazy world or something like that. Um, but how how has your crazy world been? You know, you're you're in Illinois. We're in Wisconsin. Things are different. Things are the same. But like, what's life been like for the last three uh, months, man? Um, well, money moves a lot slower, uh, but business doesn't seem to. Just money. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of um, a lot of projects. Any project that existed in February is done or gone. In my experience, like nobody found a way. Like, oh, we'll just put this on hold for three weeks or a month, and then uh -huh. we'll get back. Like, you can't put a pin in video production like that. And uh, it didn't surprise me. Um, there have been projects that have been conceived, obviously since you know lockdown talk since this has uh has been on everybody's radar but i think mm -hmm. our success rate as producers has dropped a bit right like whereas so i mean as a dp maybe half the time on average if a producer calls me up and says hey i've got a shoot probably happening on friday like are you free maybe yeah, half the time it happens yeah um whereas well, I guess happens on Friday, I should say, right? Because it'll be like, oh, well, the client wanted to reschedule. Oh, okay. Or like we had a creative brief change or the location doesn't work on Friday or whatever. Like there's always a change mm -hmm. and a shift. Um, it seems like there's more of those lately. Um, and mm -hmm. I think producers are becoming aware of like what kind of a bind last minute means now. Whereas before it's like, oh, you know, we added this thing and it needs batteries. Well, you could go to Best Buy and get them. Um, and now you can't. <laughs> and that's, yeah, that's that's a weird experience. Like the the number of like small complications that get out of hand really fast, mm -hmm. they're huge. Um, but there's production happening. I did um, I shot a commercial for um, uh, you know with Tony the Tiger, so for Kellogg's. Um, where <laughs> you were with Tony. You know, I, was, Tony? I was literally the my end, my end of the conversation oh. was the Tony end. Quick quick question. Have you ever gone as Tony the Tiger? I feel like you've got a little bit of red hair, you know, with just a little bit of makeup, you could totally be Tony the Tiger. I will bear that in mind. I will. Yeah, just keep that <laughs> safe. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> really important stuff. Okay, okay. I will uh, add that to my list of potential Halloween costumes for this year. Um, but I'm leaning toward anything I can do father-daughter because those are just adorable. Oh, nice. And just anything outside. 
<laughs> um, where were we? We we were going somewhere with this. Tony the Tiger Kellogg shoe. <laughs> yes, I I got you. I'll derail us, but I'll get us back on. I appreciate that. Um, so the the spot itself, it was a series of spots and some like web video and stuff. But the premise was that Tony the Tiger animated um, was calling um, kids and um, Shaquille so O'Neal. Very creepy. Yes. Um, yes. 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 So there's like, I don't know, they, <laughs> they, they donate, uh, Kellogg's donates a bunch of money to like um, kids, physical activity, school stuff, like schools that are. Okay. Uh, underfunded and need like sports education mm -hmm. kind of equipment and things. So um, they wanted to obviously call attention to this. So they brought Tony on and Tony was live, but animated, um, but actually mm -hmm. run as an actor. Right. Oh, so like, wow. he was mapped out. They used the unreal engine. Um, they updated it. Like if you look oh, at wow. the, like, so they, let's see, it would have been two, maybe a year and a half, two years ago, they did, Tony had a live appearance on like the Tonight Show or one of those, um, one of those evening shows, um, okay. but that was on an old engine. So this was the the Unreal Engine, and it looked real. Like it looked pretty great. I mean, it didn't look real, real, but like yeah, it was shockingly good. Uh, it was also overkill. I mean, they had Tony in a full, you know, like from head to toe, like completely motion captured, live rendered. Uh, and then, of course, like just, you know, the same frame that I'm in now <laughs> for the kids to watch. Oh, sure. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so my end of the video call was was Tony the Tiger. And uh, I didn't get to meet Shaq, unfortunately. Uh, but, but he was one on the other end of the call. So. Nice. Yeah, so on that one, what was that like? Because you didn't have an actor. Were you just being fed? on unreal footage and you just you were shooting a background or like what was going on so i was grabbing um reference stuff for when everything went terribly wrong um so they had, <laughs> as you know or like when everything went wrong or if it went wrong <laughs> well a little bit of both maybe and some fine okay. things so they want you know they wanted to capture the live experience for the kids so the kids uh -huh they need to see that the live unreal engine because it's about like Tony being able to interact with them on the fly. Mm -hmm. um, but then once you get into the, you know, a commercial where it's 15 seconds and it needs to be tightened up, whatever um, they may, they wanted to go back in or be able to go back in and like fine tune performance or like take different cuts from his whatever. So um, we used my camera, which was just on the actor without, you know, Tony the tiger being superimposed on top of him. Um, as a reference then for all the digital animation that came after that. Are you muted or do I just not hear you? <laughs> I was also trying to pull up that Tony the Tiger thing. Also, what uh, what was this set like? So were you alone? Did you have a limited crew? Are you all in biohazard suits? It's really freaking hard to work with social <laughs> distancing. Um, yeah. So some, like we definitely found some tools that help, right? Like being able to operate the camera without being at the camera is a huge help. Um, and as I've been working on a few other projects, um, Wi-Fi has been the way to go. Like I've, um, I've worked out a lot of the bugs in terms of like, okay, I can be like in the next room and actually running the camera relatively effectively. But um, but yeah, it's tough. I mean, you got to trust that these people know how to wash their hands, and like when somebody's got their their mask on halfway and whatever, like you, you got to be able to you know tell the sound guy like, hey, can do you mind putting your mask on? Or mm -hmm. conversations like, is it okay if we open the window? It's like a totally different conversation now, right? Like <clears throat> um, just basic uh, basic hygiene, basic you know keeping things healthy is. Uh, it's nerve wracking, especially in a smaller space. And this, we ended up mm -hmm. shooting in the actor's home. Um, so yeah, when you're, you know, trying to operate a camera, but trying to not, you know, step over his couch and, and also like try to not, you know, spread your germs. Should you, you everybody has to assume you have it. Um, and then like, well, you got to do meals. And so how does that work? Do we all step outside and like eat? Um, it's mm -hmm. it's crazy how important the weather is in terms of getting things done these days because like if it's like 
if you're doing production, if you're a producer now, I think my like my pin tweet right now is like, bring, bring me radios, right? Like, I mean, <laughs> like we need to be able to talk to each other and you know, assume that I'm six feet away from my assistant camera, who's six feet away from the sound guy, who's six feet away from the producer, who's six feet away from the director, and like mm -hmm. I can't shout. <laughs> like, yeah, you need radios. And even if you could, it would sound like this. Hey, where'd that go? <laughs> right. And then, of course, we're all trying to not be in the room. Like normally, the the, str the strategy, what they teach you as a PA is like get in there close, be out of the way, but like be close so you can anticipate and jump on this on whatever's needed. And so all these people that are really good at their job want to be over your shoulder and they want to be right there to help you, but they can't be. So like radios are critically important because then those people can be waiting in a green room. They can be waiting um, offset somewhere. Um, it's been yeah, it's a learning process. And then the, the other piece of equipment that should be mentioned is pop-up tents because people are going to want to go outside and you can't count on the weather, you know, being clean. Mm -hmm. Is that now the pop-up tents and then that, is that uh, <clears throat> different now with kind of COVID precautions or is that just a, a general tip? Um, basically, it's a tip that's like, you're going to need more space than you think. So no matter where you uh, are, sure. get some get some outside space that works. I mean, maybe, you know, if you're lucky, maybe your location has like a pole barn or a, you know, mm -hmm. a garage you can leave the door open on or something. But yeah, it'll be interesting too as the Midwest heads toward winter, assuming we're still facing this. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we can't just all take a meal break outside. <laughs> So mm -hmm. how are we going to get, you know, a crew of 10 people to take their masks off safely? Like, do we all eat in our cars? <laughs> we'll, we'll see. It'll be interesting. It definitely takes more time for, you know, is the thing that we kind of learned. We were, you know, doing a shoot and it's just like, you just can't move as fast because everybody's like having to stop and make sure they're doing things or whatever in the communication, slow down. And um, we also realize with, with gripping, and lighting, you know, we want to be very careful, but it's it's almost impractical or Im impossible to be like, this is your light stand. You're the only one touching it. So you just got to think too, like, okay, where where are hand washing stations? You know, make sure that we have those because one person's going to move something, somebody else, you know, is going to end up moving it. So, uh, you know, just for, for all the precautions, you know, make sure that people can wash their hands because at the end of the day, we're going to be passing by each other. We're going to touch the same things. So, you know, we got to try to try to clean everything that we can. Yeah. And the idea that, uh, um, I mean, as the, there was the recently published DGA slash everybody's guidance, um, and talking mm -hmm. about zone A, B and C, I think that's, uh, it's critical for us to understand. Mm -hmm. Like if we're going to ask talent to be taking that extra risk, right? Like I at least get to wear PPE. Right. Like I can mm -hmm. watch you like sniffle all I want, but like I've got my N95 on. Um, I'm I can social distance a little bit, but talent doesn't have that luxury. Um, and so like we really owe it to them to like create this bubble of safety to keep their risk manageable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe, maybe we can share that, too. I don't know if you have that link. You could send that over. Um, I haven't seen that specifically. We, we had a chat with uh, Michael Graff up here who's in the DGA and he's been doing a lot of those chats um, with the organization and with different producer organizations and have kind of come up with some good guidelines. But one of the interesting things <clears throat> that I uh, that they said is to not sign uh, waivers um, because, you know, I think it basically it goes to like a false sense of security and to not taking any, you know, precaution or appropriate precautions, you think, oh, well, you know, we signed this, we're good, we're safe, as opposed to taking precautions from a precautionary standpoint, you know, kind of like gloves. They recommend not to wear gloves on set because you get them, you know, you get something on them, you're just going to move it all around as opposed to if you don't have gloves, you're going to wash your hands, which is, you know, it's kind of funny, like with, at the grocery store, my wife made the joke, she's like, yeah, you know, they have all the shields up and they have gloves and they just, you know, they just touch somebody's stuff and put it in their bag. And now they're touching our stuff and put it in the bag. So how's that glove protecting everyone again? 
And you're like, oh, you're right. <laughs> Inter you know, like dumb rules don't make sense. So we got to make smart rules. I think we're also like, we love the, the idea of personal responsibility, um, but it doesn't always work when there's this other hierarchy of responsibility on a set, right? I mean, hmm. I, I would love to imagine a you know PA on a second day asking you know Mr. Scorsese could you please step away from the talent right like oh man or, um, I noticed that you didn't wash your hands <laughs> like <laughs> you're not going to do that um, yeah. so we need to we need to have a system in place that like acknowledges that and says like mm -hmm. here's a person who is responsible for safety and who you can go to and say oh, interesting. yeah. yeah. I've got, I think I found a link here. Let's see if I can actually, um, wait, it, I don't think it'll let me post a comment. I'll add it to the, this one and you can publish it. Okay. Um, I that is it. the most obscure, least helpful looking URL I've ever seen, but it should take you to this uh, DGA, sag after IATSE, Teamsters joint report, um, which is many pages long. And talks a bit about the the zone system, yes. Um, how zone A is where your actors are hanging out, and zone B is where all production is, um, and just gives you an idea of like what um, what can help actually reduce risk. Um, and I think there's mm -hmm. so much like I mean, there's so much abstraction, and then all of us being sitting at home with nothing to do, it's turned into a big political thing, um, as opposed to you know like let's what does the science say, right? Like is it cheaper to to wash hands and get masks and have somebody six feet away? Is it, you know, when is it not? When does it make sense? When is it, you know, safest? Um, and there's actual studies being done. Um, and uh, fortunately, there's, uh, yeah, there's some actual data. So, um, but of course, the the keystone to that whole plan is testing, which isn't out there in the, in the number we need right now. I mean, we need to be, um, you know, for, uh, also that, that particular document's really well suited to like longer form productions, you know, 90 minute movies. Um, sure, as, yeah. As opposed to, well, we're going to shoot a commercial on Tuesday and then I'm never going to see you guys again. Um, yeah. So I think we'll, <laughs> I think we're, we're going to see a lot more fine tuning, but the more we Ooh. can all be familiar with like the terminology, the basics, um, mm -hmm. the better off we'll be. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to talk about contact tracing and, you know, liability, because as a company, you think about, are we going to get in trouble if our set spreads something? Um, and certainly that, that hasn't been the case yet. Um, and I believe there's legislature to protect groups so that that doesn't become a thing. But if you have a commercial for a day, how do you know that's where you got it, you know, um, as opposed to the grocery store? because the likelihood of, you know, the 10 people on set getting it are, I, I assume low, unless you're all just sneezing in each other's faces, which I don't think is gonna be happening. I think everyone, you know, who's, who wants to be working is gonna be taking necessary precautions. Um, the, the numbers that are in that report, they definitely point out that the highest risk is borne by talent, like far and away, because as soon as you're wearing PPE, right, like, you're, you go into the hospital and you say, I actually have COVID and you're like, you get in your snot everywhere. The doctors still don't get it because, well, they do sometimes, but in general, when they have appropriate PPE, when they're aware of the risk exposure, they're not going to get sick because they're using the right equipment. Um, and so the same can be true for, you know, ACs and gaffers and grips and the rest. You use the right equipment. You're not usually going to get sick. Um, and especially if you combine that with, you know, taking care of yourself, you're not going to have 14 hour days. Um, you know, recognize that you're not supposed to push your body to the limit every day. Um, so, so those things work in your favor, but then when you're talent, you don't have that protective layer, right? You don't like, you're trusting everyone around you to keep their germs off of you instead of mm. trusting your equipment. Um, so, so that's really the risk. So I think, um, I think we'll start seeing some sort of standard around like must have been tested within X number of days or the production will provide testing, you know? So like, um, if you've if you've had gigs or jobs where you're like, well, we have to get like background checked beforehand or whatever, um, you know, like occasionally when I've worked in a school or something like they have to do the whole or for the president or whatever. Right. You like they yeah. got to do a background check. Um, I would have for the president. Whatever. It's cool. <laughs> no big deal. 
I, I like Sorry. that flex. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't mean to flex too hard, um, but you know, you get, you get. There's a period before the job where you're actually required to like complete some, you know, the requirements. Sure. So my guess yeah. is whether that'll be like you have to go in and like they'll pay for it. I don't know. We're gonna smash our way through that and figure it out. But hopefully, uh, hopefully, there's more testing because that's really the key. Yeah, it'll be interesting. You know, over the next six months to see how things develop because. I feel like that kind of sets the course because, you know, winter is typically flu season. And if this is somewhat comparable in terms of numbers, you know, in terms of uh, death or, or I guess the transmittability is a lot greater, but in how it functions um, be worse during winter. I think that'll inform us more too, because we're, you know, we're opening up, we're figuring out how to work again. So I don't know. We'll see. I think I think in this is just general too. I think people people are good, and despite all the politicking, you know, I, I it's so hard for me to believe that there's just people being like, "I'm going to ruin the world," and this is how. Um, I think people are just incompetent. You know, I, I I know I know that I'm incompetent sometimes too. So uh, I think if we give each other the benefit of the doubt and we do, uh, you know, what's appropriate and. Um, try our best. I think, I think that's going to be a good way to move forward and it's going to have to keep changing. You know, we had a conversation a couple of weeks ago about this and stuff has changed since then as well. Um, so we just got to keep evaluating and if people want to work, we'll just keep rolling with it. You know? Yeah. I think the, the slowdown that's happened anyway is actually a blessing, right? Like if, if there wasn't some sort of economic slowdown, if I was having a regular old June right now, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'd be terrified. Um, the The fact that we're, I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm probably like one eighth of as busy as I would normally be this time of year, um, in terms of days on set. Like, mm -hmm. it gives me a chance to talk with every producer beforehand and say, "Hey, did you think about this? And can we make, you know, can we put these pieces in place? And are you comfortable with this?" And um, it's it's a blessing. I think it means that like if the economy is ready for us, you know, we can start like walk up to a good pace by the time um, we've got you know protocols kind of in line and we've been learning. Mm -hmm. Well, I was gonna I was gonna jump in and say another thing about like the I was thinking slow down in terms of pace of life too, um, mm. and maybe this is too hopeful thinking, but it's like you know I I think I hope people are well i i also know that there are stories of businesses that are not making it through this and that i i hate that you know that that's such a shame that things happen like that but um for the ones that are still going it's like hopefully businesses are realizing hey this this actually worked out for people to like work from home every now and then um it's not the worst thing if you're like hey i'm gonna work from home that like going forward when we don't have this virus as a reason maybe it's okay when someone says hey i'm gonna work from home because like i just haven't seen the family much and kind of want to be there for lunch and you know reduce the commute today or um or like when somebody's sick hey i i kind of have a cold i think i'm just not going to come in today like that there's not that pressure that you don't feel like you're losing points at yep. work because you're not you know there like maybe we can shift our focus back to like taking care of ourselves and families and whatever um i'm very hopeful that and we've we have a little proof that it worked that it's okay you know that it works and you might have you know we have the systems like we're connected in a way now that we've never been before um that you can actually like you know, communicate with your team and get the stuff done that you need. Shoots are a little bit harder. Physical things, you know, are harder, yeah. but, um, but there are ways to make it work. That's my hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think the, the safety net for companies has done okay. Like my business has done all right. Um, in terms of, you know, like we've got a giant loan to pay off, but we're not closed. Um, and employees like hourly employees, salaried employees, I think have been pretty well caught. I'm really scared still for um, freelancers. Um, and I see like 
when I see the people on online now that are just, you know, panicking about, you know, how do I make next month's rent? How do I pay these bills? It's freelancers because those jobs are gone. And in there, there's a whole army of people just waiting to get back to work. Um, so it's cutthroat to get, you know, you know, like I could probably hire 30 grips for a shoot in two days because <laughs> mm-hmm. nobody's working. Mm-hmm. And uh, unemployment, you know, in theory, it's supposed to pay out for them, but I, I don't know a lot of people that have actually gotten that money yet. So um, it's a scary time. We lost Ryan. He just vanished. <laughs> Our host is gone. Yeah, there he is. Back. He's playing with buttons. You no, hit the red button. Literally, I just set my hands down because they were like up on my lap, and then I I don't know what the hell I hit. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Bush League here. Um, yeah, but our freelancers, right? Uh, and that's that's one thing too. I, I know that there was, you know, supposed to be some ability for them to get coverage with the PPP. I feel like I've heard of a few not being able to get it, and I, I didn't get into too long of conversations. But that, you know, that sucks because, like, you know, I feel like they're they're probably the people who need it the most. Yeah. The, and the fact that it's patchwork has made things really complicated, I think, right? Like I've got, so I'm a small business owner. I'm a freelancer. I have employees. Um, so like we, you know, we did get um, PPE loan, or I'm sorry, PPP loan. PPP. Um, and, but I have not figured out, I mean, like how to spend it in a way that's going to actually get forgiven. So we're on track now that like, I, and uh, there are many, many pages of PDF that will help me understand. But even then, I don't know for sure. Uh, you know, well, is this labor cost covered or not? And like, do I have to hire sure. people back in a certain order? Or like, what if they're not available for full time? Like, do I take them? Like, yeah, it that's gets a hard thing. And like, yeah. okay, so the needs of my company are changing. Can I hire different people? And does that money count? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, of course, like there are employees that really enjoy making 600 plus dollars a week on unemployment because they weren't making that before, you know, especially part-timers. So um, it's a, it's a mess. And the fact that it's like, okay, so there's an unemployment system that helps some people. There's the PPP loans, there's the EIDL loans, um, there's the, the government, um, the stimulus money. Um, It's like, it's all so helpful, but like, it's a lot for people to learn how to navigate all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's more coming down the pipeline too. And people who didn't get the, the, you know, first chunk. So, I mean, hopefully we can do our part. I certainly like we, we kind of made a pact, a pact, you know, we uh, had a sleepover and (laughs) braided brother's hair and John Scott and I, you know, we're all like, we're going to take pay cuts before we lay anybody off. If it comes to that, Um, you know, we really like the team that we have and the momentum that we've built. And so we're going to take extraordinary measures to keep that. Um, And luckily we were able to get the PPP as well. um, So that kind of simplified the conversation there. But yeah, I mean, I do know companies, friends who, how to lay off staff. Um, and then when you, you go to try to hire them back and, you know, most of them will come back, but some of them are like, no, I'm okay doing this for a little while. <laughs> you know, and you're like, no, that's not, that was supposed to work, but you got to do what's best for you. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, go ahead. It's, uh, it's, I'm glad that they're doing all right. I'm glad that, that unemployment is helping some people. Um, yeah. I don't. I do not think that this was the most efficient way to 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 head into this. To this, uh, you know, I think we could learn a lot as a country about like what works and and maybe what doesn't. Yeah, I'm going to say something uh, strange and political. We're going to have to actually look at what worked other places uh, and what didn't, and then compare instead of just shouting at each other. Oh, good luck. <laughs> I know. I knew it was going to be controversial. Um, so. Now we're kind of getting to a good point where we can play a little game uh, that we, it doesn't work if I say we like to call because everyone calls it, 
but that we like to play called Two Truths and a Lie. Yay! I don't think I've ever played this game sober before. Oh, good. <laughs> we are totally sober in this happy hour, and it's just kind of a way to get to know each other a little bit better. <laughs> All right. This is this is also too the best part about online chat. Uh, I thought I saw John's face moving, so I kind of backed off on what I was going to say next, expecting him to talk, but he just left me out there. So you never know. I could always I could throw something out at any moment. <laughs> John, John, do you? No, you you got. That's my favorite zooms. <laughs> just talking over each other. Um. All right, so we'll play Two Truths and a Lie. We'll get to know each other a little bit better. John and I know a lot about each other, so we'll start, uh, and you have to guess. You'll, you'll get to guess first, and then we'll save our guest for last, so you can actually have a little bit of time to think about it, too. Um, pro tip, a, a good lie is maybe a story that you know of your friend um, or something that you're very familiar with and you could tell in a believing way that is just not your story. That's a good way to do a lie. Um, Cause otherwise, you know, it works except there. You know, for many of my friends that you'll be like, Oh no, that was Jordan's story. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're like, Oh my gosh, that is the one story that Jordan always uses in two truths and a lie too. Um, yeah. John, do you want to go first? Sure. All right. All right. See, I, when I, if I prepare ahead of time, I just forget what I was what I was doing. I guess I didn't write it down, but I was thinking of this earlier. I was like, oh, this is what I'm gonna do. And now it's like I can't even remember anything about myself. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. you're like making up all the lies. Okay. Number one. I've never dyed my hair. Number two, I have no tattoos. Number three, one time I shot myself in the foot. That is all. Hmm. How does this work? We guess the we guess the lie. Uh, yeah. So we're trying to guess the lie. Or you can guess the two truths. <laughs> well, I mean that would that would work, I suppose. <laughs> um, I think you're going to surprise us with your rebel tattoo. That's what I think. <laughs> so yeah, you think the lie is that he does not have a tattoo? Yes. So you're thinking he's got like the Rebel Alliance Star Wars tattoo just right uh, here. I was imagining maybe like Jesus or something. I'm not sure, but like nice, yeah. That could happen. If I if I were to get tattoos, I'd probably get some religious and then Japanese sayings. You know, they're they're the most popular. Well, I do. I think <laughs> that's that's well. is a good idea too. Chad does yeah. the whole like the, the imperial. Have you seen his? He does. He does. Yeah, yeah. Because he's always wearing tank tops. Mm -hmm. Turns yeah. out to say <laughs> like uh, like just chicken ramen. <laughs> <laughs> super not cool like i've i've always thought of that too like i'm l trying to learn japanese and i think it's cool but like what would i say like believe and i'm like that'd be stupid in english and it'd be doubly stupid if i have to explain it in japanese <laughs> um all right so he, he picked the tattoo <clears throat> I'm about a uh, 99% sure you don't have any tattoos unless you just got one. Um, <clears throat> shot yourself in the foot. And the other one is you've never dyed your hair. Never dyed your hair. Yeah, those are, I mean, can you dye dark? Yeah, you could bleach it. Um, I'm gonna go with you've never shot yourself in the foot. Congratulations, Ryan. You are correct. <laughs> this canvas has never. <laughs> you got that nice fair skin. It would look really it's good. It's a pure canvas. Yeah, pure canvas. 
no hair, no hair dye, no tattoos, no um, hair anywhere. Um, <laughs> I, this got always, weird. Always very good gun safety. Uh, all the times hunting. I was trying to think if I was like even a BB gun. I was like no, that's, I, that's what I was thinking. Like maybe a BB gun or like a Nerf gun or. Uh, that would be, yeah, I wouldn't have gone down that road. <laughs> All right. So you have dyed your hair? I have not. No. You, I, I said I have never dyed my hair. Oh, okay. That was the truth. Yeah. And he, heard, and he had no, so you shot someone in the foot is what you're saying. <laughs> I think that's I, how that goes. I said I had. I said I had shot myself in the foot. One time I shot myself in the, in the foot. Okay. So you managed to do two truths in the lie where they all make you look good is what you're saying. I mean. I'm going to remember that for next time. I just told, I just told <laughs> you know, things that are true and one lie. And all right. My, my, I, I'm incredibly you know, handsome. <laughs> yeah. I'm incredibly benevolent. Sometimes and, I get background checks when I like go to schools, when I hang with the president. <laughs> Whatevs. It's just huge. It's huge. <clears throat> All right, I'll go next. Uh, save our guests for last. So let's see. I think I wrote some things down. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I guess I'll go with that. I dyed my hair all throughout high school. Um, my father was in the Navy. And I have lived in, let's see, Orlando. I know the middle one's about, about your dad. It's not about you. It's not about <laughs> <laughs> it's not about you. Somebody else. <laughs> I mean, he's mine. He's my dad. I mean, I get you. I'm just saying, like, it's it was phrased differently. So my I'm gonna go with that one. I think that's the the oddball. Okay. Good guess. If you say so. He he likes to I I did it once and then and then he started stealing my technique of, like <laughs> using somebody else's story and then telling it so that you like have a smooth delivery you know I really like that your, take story. your stories and have a version of your story <laughs> um the question is did he i could see him being a frosted tips guy all through high school yeah look at that hair it would look great with frosted tips <laughs> <laughs> um but i can't think of uh I don't know. I I didn't know Ryan in high school. I've known him a long, long time. But um, so we got hair, navy, uh, Orlando, and then that would be one of those detail ones where it's like, oh, I lived, I lived in the suburb, right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go. Oh. I'm yep. I'm gonna. I'm my. The third one is my guess. You're lying about Orlando. You lived in <laughs> Jacksonville. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, it's true. I mean, it's not true. You're correct. I live in Jacksonville. Um, the best part is, and this has happened a couple times with me. I thought I was telling a truth. I thought I told three truths. Uh, sometimes I suck at this game. I know, I know. But that was a lie. That was a lie. John Cott. We went, I think we drove by there one time when we were filming, right? Like we took a little trip over to Jacksonville um, yeah. to see my old house, which was weird because it looked a lot tinier. Um, yeah, my dad was in the Navy. <clears throat> I was going to lie. I said it in the beginning. So that's kind of why I was uh, using it. Um, I thought it was maybe just military. I remember Navy. So I was like, I bet he's Air Force. It could have been. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I've got a, a fun little surprise for you guys. Uh, so 
I swam in high school. That was kind of my major sport. <clears throat> and I was of a uh, pretty decent uh, skill. Um, and I definitely dyed my hair, oh, or bleached yeah. my hair. Photographic <laughs> evidence. Um, this is me and my good buddy, Jimmy. And uh, it was terrible. I mean, yeah. as terrible as you see. That's not uh, enough of an explanation. You need to continue explaining that. <laughs> oh, oh. And so this was, I think this was homecoming one year. Um, we Wait, were. Are you saying you weren't wearing this ironically? Oh my gosh. It was totally ironically. Dumb okay. and dumber. Like, look at the big ring. It's a, it's a giant diamond ring. Just check it. <laughs> uh, around. <laughs> no, we, I mean, it was, it was the late nineties. So we might've thought we were this cool. Um, but, uh, if you yeah, want, I, this could be like, you were a best man in his wedding or something <laughs> <laughs> with this style. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, uh, my tr two truths and a lie. What do you got for us, John? Um, I've been, I've been writing notes to see if I can come up with ways that make me sound interesting. Uh, and having failed that here we go. Um, I played guitar in a band. Um, that was the story I told you was not the first time that I worked with Tony the Tiger and I have, hang on, let me make sure I'm giving two truths and a lie here before I figure this out. <laughs> or two lies and a truth. To, yeah, I don't even know. This game's so hard, man. I can't. Like, I should have a beer. I need a beer. <laughs> My Lacroix's not cutting it. <clears throat> um, and is that the, is that the three percent Lacroix? Uh, this one's this one's limoncello. What'd you ask? Three percent alcohol in that Lacroix. <laughs> <laughs> hard hard <laughs> Lacroix. How you mix it? <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think so. I think so. Um, and I have only shot in the U.S. and Mexico. There we go. Ooh. John, you go first. Shoemaker, not Klein. I, you I know. You for I, yourself. Know. I, think. I think I know. I have to check my notes. Uh, what was the first one again? I played guitar in a band. Okay, yeah. All right. I think I think you're, you're musical. I feel like I've talked about this with you. I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna accept that one. Um, threw me for a loop of the third one. I thought it was gonna be. I was gonna say that was the the lie because it was taking a while, but maybe we we're ready. What was the second one? The first one was the guitar. guitar. Second one was that was not the first time you shot with Tony the Tiger. He said it was not. He said it was not the first time, which also could be plausible because seems like just a random thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but may, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna go with that one. I'm gonna say that was that not the first time. That multiple times is the lie. All right, so. Yeah, I feel like you. I feel like you've talked about guitar. We've talked about guitar before. I feel like that's a thing I've heard. Um, Tony the Tiger thing. I don't. I don't have any knowledge of. The third one you said you've only filmed in Mexico and the U.S. Either I'm I'm really dumb, or you've definitely filmed in Australia, uh, where you filmed. Let's oh, see. Yeah. I might be able to come up with uh, oh, the boy. name of that film, oh, boy. that short film, uh, Dusters. Yep. Dusters. I'm pretty there sure you know. shot Dusters in Australia with yeah. friends of ours. <laughs> Brian paying attention. I think that's a lie. <laughs> Brian's paying attention. That was uh, that was that was a test, John. You failed. You're not my friend anymore. <laughs> I, cha I changed. I it. it. <laughs> Be friend. <laughs> Have you have you only filmed in Mexico, the U.S., and in Australia? Uh, and I haven't even filmed for paid work in Mexico. So yes, oh, okay. nice. yes, the United States and Australia, uh, and then otherwise, yeah, I'm uh, I'm still waiting for someone to call me up and say I own this resort in Mexico. 
Oh yeah. Please, please come down. And uh, yeah, that, that's, that's on my bucket list yet. Yeah. Here, here's the deal. We'll shoot for two days and make something uh, the rest of the week. We'll edit it for you, but then you got to let us stay there the next week. Yeah. Deal? We can do post-production in the suites. Oh my gosh. <laughs> That'd be worth it. Yeah. Just call room service and yeah. Slip it um, under the door. <laughs> yeah. We, we have friends too who, you know, work in media and are connected to like Italy and Rome. Obviously now is not a great time, but we're always like, ah, come on, let's produce something over there. Just send us. We'll just do it. Send us, pay for us to go. So we'll see if that happens. Yeah, it's going to be a while before people want Americans in their, you know, country, I think. Yeah, We're, there's, a, there's a lot of places that aren't accepting us right now. But I think there are some places that are just incentivizing anyone. They're just like, anyone, please come to our country. And I can't remember which is which. Well, if they're not concerned about the virus, they're going to be concerned that we're going to come there and burn something down. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, we're not true. Really infected and <laughs> infected. That's the American way. We're not, we're not helping our image. <laughs> <laughs> no. Poor State Street. Um, so we are wrapping down here. Uh, I did want to get your recommendations before we get any plugs. Um, recommendations on movies or you know, art or TV or just anything that you've been consuming or enjoying lately. You, you should have warned me. I mean, I've been like everybody else. I watched uh, Tiger King over this. <laughs> <laughs> I did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. My, uh, I've been, I've been digging up, digging up the old stuff in this break. I watched like pretty much all of Star Trek, everything. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> even the bad out. ones. Uh, especially the, like the movies. Uh, yes. Yes. And um, you can learn a lot, you know, from other people's mistakes. At least I think you can. So, yeah. How not to make a Star Wars movie specifically. Um, well, I've enjoyed the new Star Wars. I know a lot of people are, excuse me, Star Trek. Oh my God. I, I I can't believe I did I that. Of, yeah. You just sort of did the faux oh. pas. I was like, oh. do does he know that he said Star Wars? <laughs> we, we, we started the new CBS uh, Star Trek. Um, the, and that's been very enjoyable. No, we haven't gotten to Picard yet. Just just the new Star Trek uh, Discovery. Um, which has been really fun. It, it feels more like original Star Trek. Just kind of, you know, it's got an overarching story. But, like, you'll just have a one-off. You know, you'll have a, a canned episode. And it's silly and goofy and fun. Um, and it's, it's, it's. You're saying Discovery was goofy? I oh, mean, yeah. I guess a little bit. Like there are characters that are goofy. They're not episodes that are goofy. I mean, there. Now I can't think of the can episode. Um, there was one, and we're, we're not in the latest season. So it's like in the last season. Yeah. Spoiler when, alert. Spoiler alert. <laughs> I don't know if I can talk about it when they're in the alternate universe. Um, but there was a can episode over there that you're right. It's not comedy necessarily, but it's fun. Uh, playful. It's playful. Um, and I enjoyed that. And I, I don't think, you know, original Star Trek was obviously not intended as a comedy, but now you watch it now and uh, you know, Chopping an alien <laughs> is the funniest thing <laughs> ever. <laughs> well, and sleeping your way through the universe itself gets kind of hilarious <laughs> after a while. It's like, is that like your ninth alien this season? Yeah. <laughs> um, any particular Star Trek that you recommend uh, people go back and watch that you've enjoyed? Oh, no, that puts too much pressure on it. Wow. I, uh, I will <laughs> say that, that now that – so I – Having caught up on all the old stuff, the new stuff was more enjoyable, right? Oh. So they do like, because the, they have two worlds, right? And like, yeah. I didn't really understand like how they connected them. Like you got two Spocks and whatever. And I didn't, you know, I had sure. to, not a way to unpack that all. As, as I uh, went back into the old stuff, the new stuff was. Um, yeah. And just fitting Rise of Skywalker in there was so, like, they just did it so smoothly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Disney doesn't own Star Trek yet. <laughs> yet. 
Uh, John Shoemaker, what you have any recommendations? What have you been watching? Um, so I think we, we talked about this a little bit. We watched some of Space Force. I was very excited to watch that. But it was terrible. It's not a, I don't, I can't give it a high recommendation. It's just, I, I like Steve Carell. I like Ben Schwartz. Um, John Malkovich is just on autopilot. He's, he's kind yeah. of, he's pulling a, uh, he's being John Malkovich. He, I, I, liked him in it. I liked him in it. Um, so I don't know. I'm just, I, I, I'll watch it, but it's, it's not what I was hoping it would be. Um, but it's got us talking about it. We, we watched some, we finally, I keep getting the ads for it and we finally started watching uh, Chosen. So, oh yeah, they that, advertise that hard. That's the uh, serial um, Jesus story. Oh. And, it's, and what's this, really is, this is not, this is not the one I was thinking. <laughs> 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 What's it really tunes out immediately. Intriguing is uh, it's more interesting the the sort of case study of so it's the same group that runs Harmon Brothers, um, the uh, video <laughs> advertisers that did Squatty Potty and um, uh, Poopery and some of the like just funny viral uh, video stuff. Yeah. Marketing. And they produce this themselves, and they have like an interesting model where they're like, "Are we combining squatty potty aesthetics with Jesus as the storyline?" No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. The the marketers who brought you squatty potty. Well, and in a new a, tale of Jesus, it's not a it's not a whitewashed Anglo-Saxon Jesus. You know, it's it's um, I. I'm going to butcher it. I shouldn't even say it. Like, it's whatever ethnicity <laughs> lives there. I, I would imagine he'd be Jewish. Is he Arabic or something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, well, yeah, I mean, they'd be, yeah. It's been an enjoyable, and and it's a, um, there's other storylines. So, like, sometimes you fall into where they just go with, like, what is in in the Bible, in these passages, and this is like, oh, it's kind of fun to see like this little side storyline with this household and you know this family and just kind of get to know the characters more. So that's been enjoying uh, enjoyable. And I believe it's free on YouTube with a uh, pay what you want and share with friends or something. Well, that, that's like, the interesting thing is the model is like they're kind of encouraging people like. Hey, if you want to share it with somebody else, you know, this like pay it forward model, like help us keep producing it, whatever. So that's intriguing. Um, the other thing that we've been doing a lot recently, and it's nice to kind of get back into it. We've been reading a lot more. So I started going back into like chapter books for um, bedtime with specifically with the girls. So I've been going through Narnia. We started with nice. we started with the the prequel, the magician's nephew. Now we're into Narnia. We're going to keep going, and I've been hearing rumors that maybe there's going to be a whole series on Netflix. Ooh, wow. that would be fun. That's going to go back through all those those books. Yeah, the movies had to be. They were a whirlwind tour of the magic. Yeah, of yeah. So, reading. Reading has been <laughs> enjoyable once again. Ah, uh, quarantine. The, the order is the one that Netflix keeps pushing all over my face, not the chosen. The order. That's the one that I was thinking of when you said that. And when somebody advertises to me hard, I just go the opposite way. I run away. Um, <clears throat> it's spoken cool. like a true marketer. You're like, I'm oh to respond to advertising. Allow Game. me to tell you on advertising. <laughs> if you try too hard, I don't want it. You got to neg me. You got to make me want you. <laughs> yeah. You should definitely um, not see this film. Just so we're clear. Ooh, what's the film? <laughs> <laughs> or the kind of, uh, it's like, I don't care if you watch it. You know, I mean, whatever. All right. Um, all right. So anything else to plug? Anything you want to share? 
Um, I recently shot a short film while in like observing social distancing rules and everything else where I was um, DP, gaffer, grip, best boy, AC. Uh, <laughs> PC was director um, and remotely, of course. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's called Pole Climb. So that'll probably, yeah, it'll be one of the films that you'll see coming up for me, hopefully in like the medium term horizon. Nice. On um, Facebook, we can find it probably. Um, well, we're, yeah, it'll be, you'll follow me on Facebook or whatever. You'll definitely hear about it. So the, the cool. thinking is since, you know, all the film festivals aren't actually happening that we will, uh, well, I mean, are they happening online? We'll just do an online release basically. Yeah. Cool. Hey, there's the spouse knocking on the door that we talked about. Is it? Is it? I got a text too. Like, hey, when are you guys down? They want to come down there. Um, and obviously, if you're in the Midwest, check out uh, MKE Production or MKE Production Rental, right? MKE Production Rental dot com. Yep. MKEPR, yes. MKEPR. Get your Alexa Mini LF and all sorts of other cameras and all the gear you could need for the Midwest. Lenses, your shoe. Microphones, lights. What do you need? We got come on down. Commercial. I think we <laughs> nailed it. Rolls across the bottom. Yeah. All right. We did it. Awesome. Thanks so much, John, for joining us. And uh, tune in next week for Rachel Werner, a good friend who I've known for, golly, maybe 16 years or so, almost as long as I've been here. Um, she's a marketer. She is just kind of a social uh, media guru and she does so much stuff. I was talking to her, I was like, what do you do exactly? So we're gonna explore that because I just see her um, all, you know, all over different companies, social media, helping out, writing stuff. She's just all over the place, it's awesome. I wanna hear what's going on with her. So we'll be talking with her. So please tune in next week for that. That'll be next week, Thursday the 25th i don't know just look on on the facebook or whatever it'll be there um and that's it we did it yeah thanks guys thank you ta-ta for now <laughs>